Okay, so this is the last piece we're going to do, and I'm going to do a little bit of demo in this section, but not a big one. Basically, want to play with SCED yield, and there's a compact SCED yield. Go to sysctl-a and grep for yield. And I want to talk about uh, barrier synchronization. So, basically talking about con uh, process switching, context switches. We've seen already several times that switch task, finish switch task, CPU scheduler. Uh, the vanilla SLUS 11 SP1 kernel has a bug in it. You have to be at at least a PTF2 kernel to avoid context switch storms. And on SMNs and on ICE, you may not ha have that proper kernel. This is being driven by the IPMI kernel module for IPMI, IPMI tool in band. So we don't see it on systems where IPMI is check config off. Yesterday I logged into NASDAQ server, did a quick look, saw it at high system time, high context switches. So then I stopped IPMI and the problem went away. I want to talk about priorities, which are meaningless. Basically everything we do really is to turn off the CPU scheduler, put things into a CPU set, and use dplace to pin things down in there. The CPU scheduler is a very poor scheduler for the type of work that we're doing. And in particular, the completely fair scheduler is the wrong way to go for our market. Now, I used to teach fair share scheduling back in Cray days and back in IRIX days, but those were small, real memory machines. Nowadays, with the completely fair share scheduler, I could say I get 10%, you get 50%. But my 10% is not all productive 10% because your 50% keeps stealing cycles away from me, causing me to rewarm my cash when I get reconnected. And if I have a very, very low share, by the time I get my cash loaded, I get kicked out of the cash again and I get and kicked out of the CPU and I thrash on cash due to the CPU scheduler. So the fair share scheduler is never fair because the ones with lower shares or lower entitlement aren't getting real productive entitlement because they're taking a lot more cash misses than the person that has the larger share. Also in the latest uh, SLES 11 and higher, the priorities have been turned off or are not visible really. Everything has the same priority in top except for real time. I want to talk about CPU scheduler bottlenecks and some solutions. So again, all of our operating systems nowadays are what's called a preemptive time-sliced operating system. This means we use a clock interrupt to interrupt a program and let the CPU scheduler figure out what to do. But the programs are transparent to this, so we have a program that thinks it's the only one using the CPU. So we give time slice limits. The time of process is connected to a CPU. Now, in older Unix days, we used to have major, minor clock ticks, IRIX days. Nowadays, with Linux, it's called a Jiffy. So a Jiffy is the name for our time slice. And you get the older one, let's see, we went from 100 to 1024 on Itanium, and then down to 250 clock ticks per second. We used to call this HZ, or Hertz. That was the frequency of the scheduler clock tick. This was what we called a minor clock tick, and now we call it a jiffy. So the default for a jiffy is about four milliseconds per clock period. And there was that int stats. If you're logged into one of the Floyds, type in int stats, and you should be able to see the clock ticks occurring. Let me uh, jump off here, because we saw them the other day. Int stats. Oops. And here we're seeing it. Now this is a cumulative, so I need to toggle it. And here we're seeing the clock ticks as XXX timer. And what I was looking for was loc. And I'm not seeing loc in here anymore. Let me just see what's going on here. Quit. I'm going to do a wrap. Loc on uh, proc interrupts, oops, lowercase. 
So there is a log field here. Let's see if it's incrementing. You can see that it's incrementing, but I don't have it in a delta. So I had that as the clock interrupts, but when I go back into instats, instats is not printing out log, but I think it's printing it out as this. This oh that's inter oh that's right, it's a toggle. I need a T for a delta. And again, I can write move to the right for my CPU number, and we see 250 clock ticks per second. I can also see, for example, here, this was my uh, RAID device where the interrupts are coming in. Let's see if we can find them. There they were, CPU 16 and 17. And by the way, let's see if it's still here. Yes, I was looking for this last week, and it seemed to have been missing. I don't know if it got killed by an OOM or whatever, but this SGI IRQ balancer is spreading out interrupts across the socket so that one CPU doesn't get hit all the time. Let me go back to the slides. <clears throat> so in instats, you make a note, that was the XXX colon timer is what the uh, command does. We also have context switching again, so when I get a jiffy, I may be able to get back to the CPU or the kernel may say, it's time you've had your share, let's kick you out of the CPU, save your state and connect a new state. Now again, there are two types of context switches. One is between hyperthreads, and when we context switch between hyperthreads, both states are on chip. And all we have to do is flip between the two states. That's really what a hyper-threaded core is, is that it's got room on the core to keep track of two states. But there's not room on the core to keep track of or to have two sets of functional units and two sets of caches. That, those then get called separate cores. So context switch is saving the state of the process connected to a CPU, disconnecting that process, then connecting a different process, and restoring the state of the new process on that CPU. And the state is the program counter in the internal registers of the process. And SAR-W tracks context switches. And I had a context switch storm yesterday on NASDAQ server from an IPMI tool bug. So time slices. These are variable time slices for non-real time. Anywhere from 4 milliseconds or 1 jiffy up to 800 milliseconds. The default time slice for people coming in without changing nice or anything is an 80 millisecond time slice. But then this is based upon a fair share entitlement, what they're calling the completely fair share scheduler. Priorities for interactive, also referred to as normal or batch, are between 100 and 139. I've got a drawing for this. So 100 is best, 139 is the worst. And NICE influences that. For real time, we go from 0 to 100. And in real time, we can do round robin, which means sked yield and give up the CPU, or first in, first out, which means never allow the CPU to be given up. So here's the life of a process. Over on the right, we're running in user mode, we're running in system mode, we're runnable, or we're sleeping. Okay, and sleeping could be in a non-interruptible D state as well. Over here, we can also have a state of a T, I'm sorry, a Z for zombie, or there is the ability to have a T state, which is kind of like a sleeping. It's a trace state, but it's also the pause state. So I start off with my parent process, let's just say it's bash, and then I type in an LS command. So the LS command, the bash is going to fork off a child and then go to sleep with a wait if there is no ampersand sign. But if there is an ampersand sign, then there's no wait. So a fork or a clone for that matter is the way that we create a process or a thread. We jump into the kernel system call, the kernel creates that entry in the process table, and then the process is put on the run queue, runnable but not running. So at some point the kernel says, okay, you're entitled to the CPU, so we context switch 
and put the process on the CPU. Now the first thing the process has to do is take a TLB miss to be able to find an address more than likely. E executable binary address, if anything. Software interrupts are known as exceptions. So the most common one is a TLB miss, a page fault. So a page fault results be going into the kernel, looking in the page table, finding the address, putting it into the TLB buffer, and then reconnecting the process through a hot path. A process will not lose the CPU on a TLB miss. We don't want to load the TLB and then never give the CPU back to that process. So TLB misses will never result in a context switch and we will have a hot path going back there. I should say a, a minor page fault. If, if I did take a TLB miss and the page was out on swap or had to be allocated, that could result in a sleep. So if I did take a TLB miss and had to wait for the page to come in from uh, disk, then that process is going to be put to sleep, what we call a blocked process, on some sort of sleep lock. Now, when we were using PERF earlier today, those were spin locks. And we saw that IRQ spin locks. These are sleep locks. How do we look at a sleep lock? Crash. That's what's going to give me my sleep locks. So we need to have a stack trace. If the process is running, there's nothing in the kernel stack. If I make a system call jump into the kernel, then we're going to actually see the stack trace when the process was being put to sleep. So WCHAN, I can't imagine as an administrator not having WCHAN in my top display so I can see if the process is running, runnable, or sleeping. So I've read that uh, executable in from slash bin, the IO event, and the K worker now. So we get an interrupt handler, the IRQ save sees the interrupt, and then passes the interrupt handler off to the K worker thing, and then K worker takes care of the interrupt, and then wakes up the process and puts it back on the run queue. And then at some point, it gets run again. But let's say the next system call then is a write. So when I do a write, I might again end up in a WCHAN event, but let's just assume the page cache works, it gets copied to the page cache, and but every time I do a system call, I could be preempted. So even though I, I uh, did a write and got my I.O. done right away, the CPU scheduler says, hey, you made a system call, I've decided to kick you out. So you might not get your full jiffy because of interrupts. We've always said, or because of system calls. We've always said, stay out of the kernel. Don't abuse the kernel. Now, what deliberately preempts the CPU? What system call preempts the CPU on purpose? Sked yield. So there are programs, OpenMP and Intel MPI, that will do a sked yield. They'll do the Futex wait, which is the, the phone call barrier check. Are you done? Are you done? Are you done? And then they give up and yield the CPU with the SCED yield. And we saw that yesterday, and I want to do that again today, where I had barriers stuck and they were thrashing on SCED yields, giving me system time. And there is a sysctl parameter for SCED yield compat. I strongly advise to set that to 1, unless everything you're doing is in a CPU set. I want to demonstrate that. There are sites that just run jobs wide open without CPU sets because they want to keep the CPUs busy, but there's no guarantee that keeping the CPU busy is productive CPUs. <clears throat> so uh, I've got applications out that they're overcommitted and preempting and have high system time sticking on barriers. So I make a system call and I get preempted. I get put back on the run queue. Again, preemption is going down to a WCHAN event. Then I get put back on the run queue, and then eventually I get running again. All the things that happen, we have a clock interrupt. Again, one of the clock interrupts, the minor clock tick, calls called a jiffy. And we can also have IO interrupts. Again, these are tracked with instats. And we have the IRQ save, and it's on a per CPU basis that you can see that stuff. When the process is in the kernel, by the way, we can be handling interrupts. We are able to handle interrupts while we're in the kernel. 
And then when the process is either done, it's killed, it's seg faulted, or it's exited, then the process goes away and it becomes a zombie or what we also call the defunct process. Now basically a zombie or defunct process has given up all the user memory space, but the process table entries are still not there. I'm sorry, process table entries are still there. So we still have structures in the kernel describing this process even though it's given up its memory. Now what I was trying to, I jumped ahead in my head, what I was trying to say is if this process had open sockets, there is a timeout on how long an open socket is left hanging. And I had one site that was like an Oracle site, they were disconnecting from the database engine ROM, leaving open sockets dangling there, and then all these zombies would come in and wait until the socket timeout is reached before the zombie goes away. Also, earlier this week during a process storm, I was trying to create zombies, but I pushed the system too far into the 2 million proc range, and that also created problems. But I have three types of zombies. One zombie is where the parent is dead, is gone. When the child terminates, the parent is what gets the bill. All the accounting and stuff goes back to the parent, but if the parent isn't there, if the parent got killed, the grandparent of everybody in it inherits the child uh, process that has died, and the zombie will not go away until a reboot. That's one type of zombie. The other type of zombie is, again, if I have a process storm, if it takes time to clean up 100,000 processes from the process table, you're going to see those zombies stick around until they get cleaned up. And the third type of zombie is one that resources are being held by the dead process. And the only one I, example I can think of are network socket connections. And you got sock list to list all your socket connections. And a sysetail parameter to control how long those sockets are held before a timeout. This particular site had performance problems, not necessarily from the fact that they had a lot of zombies, but because of the socket connection problems that they were creating and hitch, hitting a limit to the maximum number of sockets that can be held. Any questions? So, to me, WCHAN is important. Here's a SCED yield. That's a good indication of barrier synchronization. The other one for barrier synchronization was a Futex kind of routine. So we've got two types of barriers, a spin barrier and a yield barrier. A spin barrier will show up as user time. A yield barrier will show up as system time and a WCHAN event. And a yield barrier, the few texts are, are you done, are you done, are you done, are you done? And then we give up after a little while and that results in a SCED yield. And there's a KMP block time that says how long do I spin before I yield? What we really need is what IRIX had, which was an SGI NAP. SCED yield does not have any arguments to it. When I do a SCED yield, it can throw it right back to me and I thrash on the SCED yield. IRIX with SGI NAP had a parameter pass with SGI NAP that said, keep it away from me for a given amount of time. In other words, I don't want it. I'm waiting for somebody else to use it so they can get back to me. And that would reduce the intensity of the SCED yields and reduce the system time. By the way, this is a real old kernel, and I can see a downlock in here, too, and PD flushes. So this is an older kernel, but I was just trying to catch some different things. I don't see a skip RBS switch anymore. That appears to be gone. Yesterday, we were seeing the SCED yields. Here I've got XFS locks where they've gone to sleep, and again, this is still showing the down lock, which is all going to be part of the load level. Nowadays, when the kernel prints out WCHAN, it compares the address of WCHAN and says if it's in the range of the generic kernel lock handler routines, don't print it. And then it will skip, basically it goes to the stack and says if it's in this address range, it's generic, skip it. And it goes down the stack until the address is outside the range the kernel is looking at. 
also have uh, things waiting on trying to get an XFS buffer. And that's where the uh, XFS stats and the get buffs and, and lock buffs and buff founds and stuff would be relevant. Here I'm looking at that code five, which was a metadata thing. So here we're looking at make dir. Here we did the make dir. We tried to allocate the uh, inode or directory, it looks like. We tried to allocate a directory. We figured out which allocation group it was. We then tried to get buffers. And here we hit a buffer lock. So this is contending on file system buffer cache. When I talked about cache domination, this is what cache domination would look like. Couple more things. So here I see code four. Sync pages are the write outs. Get to me, Mike, the get requests were always an I input. Sync pages were always an output. And this is an older report again, but it got congestion in here, which is block congestion. We weren't seeing that this week with this newer kernel. We were seeing the flush daemon get stick on the get request instead of the applications. So we got sync pages, get request, and block congestion. Those were the key ones that show up as an IO wait up here. Again, that was the IO sked lock, not the down lock. Here's another one. This one's just trying to write. We're trying to write a file here. Try to perform a generic write. We try to grab some cache. We have to allocate cache. Looks like we ran into a memory shortage situation, so we tried to free pages. And it looks like we went to the kernel first and trimmed the kernel, then the cache inactive, then the active, and then we ended up with a swap out. Again, I'm not seeing buff mem or inode versus directory in this stack, depending upon what it found in each area. So at that point, we have to swap something out. We submitted the IO request, and here's the get request that we're waiting on. So here's another one. This one's a write. I'm writing a file. Uh, begin the write. This is just a little bit different. And this is an older kernel, so I'm not sure that I care. There's the down lock again. And in this case, we're writing an inode, it looks like. Look, the file is growing. So we're updating the block map for the file in the inode. And then it hits some sort of RW sem lock. Again, every kernel, this stuff can change. Here's a memory one. Again, it looks like it took a fault, found that the page was out on swap, so it had to bring the swap in. There's that sync page, and then it went to sleep in IOSCED until that page came in. So that's just a couple of different uh, traceback examples. Okay. CPU schedulers changed. In SLES 10 and earlier, it was known as the 01 scheduler. It had what are called run queues, jiffies, and fixed time slices based upon priority. They redesigned the kernel, and they did not keep the older scheduler. The newer scheduler is called the completely fair scheduler. Uh, it used to be known as a fair share scheduler, but it's never fair, and it doesn't consider how much thrashing you're going to do in other words, I may ask for 50% and you get 20%. Your 20% will not be productive 20 because I'll keep stepping on your CPUs, polluting your caches. You reconnect, have to rewarm your cache. And I've got real good hardware counter perfects data to prove this. So it was new in the 2623 kernel. We're at a 3.0 kernel now. It had the concept of extension in classes, but they didn't put an 01 scheduler back in. They replaced it. And they also did a few things here. Instead of uh, the link list that they had, they went to a new type of search algorithm called a red black tree. You can Google it, but like a, R, uh, like a B tree, it's just another uh, algorithm to be able to do searches. And they do that instead of an older technique that was a link list. Now, also, uh, there used to be a sked underscore other, and that has now been replaced with sked normal. They are the same thing. And basically, that is interactive. Now, this is the thing that's kind of hard to explain. Wait, w, wait runtime is the amount of time the task should now run on a CPU for it to be completely fair. 
and there is a min v runtime and exec runtime in the sked debug file. This is kind of, kind of like my entitlement. Trouble is, there's no tool to actually print this stuff out to make it meaningful. And there is a thing here to control the granularity of the scheduler, which was 80 milliseconds by default. But again, what we're trying to do is turn off the CPU scheduler, lock things down with D plates and CPU sets or task set, and not let anybody else near that CPU. Now, they also claimed in their documentation sked yield improvements. I see a severe degradation in sked yield. I don't know what they're talking about. And I'll pro prove that here if I could get the time. So each CPU has a run queue. The run queue is an RB tree. Each CPU has its own run queue. That gives me affinity and also decouples my run queue. I remember a long time ago when Cray put out a 64 CPU uh, YMP or something, it was 100% system time, and all that system time was spinning on the run queue lock. So now we lock on a per CPU basis. That gives me affinity, and that decouples the run queue, allowing each CPU to go into the run queue on its own. We need to lock the run queue so we don't change a pointer list and have two things changing a linked list at the same time and corrupting the linked list. So that run queue is a priority ordered B tree. It is put into the run queue in priority. So when we put a process into the run queue, it is inserted into the run queue in a priority scheme. And each run queue, each I should say each priority level is in the run queue is itself a 5-0. So when I put it in, I look at the priority and then put it into that priority's run queue. Now this run queue has an active and an expired. So processes that have entitlement remaining are still on an active list. If they, and they will always execute before expired. But we can also have a process that hasn't done anything for a while and has expired, or a process that has exceeded their entitlement. Now I got this with lower priority is not true now. We no longer have what uh, SLES 10 did priority skewing. In SLES 10, I would come in at 20, go down to 15, which was my best and go up to 25, which was my worst priority. But that stuff is all gone now. Everything is at 20 unless it's a real time. And the real scheduler priority scheme is in that entitlement usage field in the uh, proc debug info file. So this doesn't really matter anymore. Expired are the first ones to be load balanced. If I go idle, I'm going to look for a CPU that has a large run queue, and it will be migrated to the least loaded CPU. This load balancing occurs when I got a greater than 25% imbalance. Exact when it does do a load balance, it examines all C I should say it examines all CPUs in a process exec to do a load balance. It will pull from the CPU with the highest load if we need the balance. But it will not touch. There is a field in the process table called hot, tells how hot the cache is. It will also not touch things that are CPU set or pinned with DPlays, NUMA CTL. And also in the real time market, you can isolate a CPU and restrict it basically so that the CPU scheduler will not look at an isolate CPU type of convention. So these are the windows of opportunity for a context switch. Every time I do a context switch, I got a it's called a voluntary yield. If I make a system call and do not context switch, I'm okay. But if I make a system call and the kernel says, ha, 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 you asked me to do something, but I'm not going to take care of you, and I'm going to put you on the uh, run queue. That would be a voluntary yield. We also have our hardware resolution counter that can give me my minimum time slice. But in general, every four milliseconds, we're getting a jiffy, which is what we're calling the clock interrupt. Now, I have to add in here, this is with a no hertz equals on, not off. 
So they've done something different now. This clock interrupt was occurring to every CPU, but now they've got just one thread that wanders around the system to handle the clock interrupts. So you don't see 250 clock interrupts per second on each CPU. But that creates problem in our market because that wandering thread could bang into one of our applications and stick barriers, <coughs> cause priority problems, and things like that. Again, uh, every 80 milliseconds is the default time slice. What was that 20, uh, 20 jiffies? IRIX, it was 100 milliseconds by default. And there is a load balancer that can occur be anywhere between 8 and 100 milliseconds. <coughs> by the way, these are known as involuntary. <coughs> switches. Let me go off to my desktop here. Okay, it looks like it's quiet here. Notice I still have a lot of have, have a lot of buffers. Let me just do a BC free dash A to clear that up. So I had 180 gig of cache and buff mem here, and now I'm trying to free that memory, and we can see it's taking time to free this up. That's why we want to do limits on this stuff. I don't know about whether the, uh, it looks like buff mem might be part of that page cache limit, but I don't know for sure. I've not tried it. I was also running something within a CPU set, I believe, and that might have contained buff mem to just half my memory. While that's happening, let me try, oops, not that one. Yeah, that was the, there's the BC free. What I wanted to show you is if I cat slash proc slash dollar dollar slash status, I have some relevant information here. Here is my CPU mask. Let me just cat slash proc slash CPU dollar dollar slash CPU set. So I am in the global and I can see everything here, both in bit mask and in CPU numbering schemes. Same thing for memory, so I can see the nodes that I can use and I can use all nodes. And then I have my voluntary context switches and my non-voluntary due to the CPU scheduler. Looks like my uh, BC free is about finished now, but Again, that was a significant amount of time to just recover that memory. BC free is not returned back yet. And keep in mind, I'm only on a 256 gig machine. Imagine a 16 terabyte machine. By the way, I can do a task task set dash p on a PID, and it will print out that affinity mask again. Same thing that we had here. Okay, now let me just do a command here. Let's cd in the home guest drill wl dot slash code to mp static is an MP, open mp application. Uh, let, actually, let me do it as a d place dash c zero to. 15. I'm just guessing here. Put that into the background. Let me do a let me do a cat um, slash proc slash dollar dollar slash uh, status. No, I don't want dollar dollar. Four four three five four status. Oops, it finished already.
there I was able to catch it and notice that I do have what did I do for a D place though? Zero to fifteen. It's only showing me one interesting. Okay, I think I know why. I need to do this. Let's see if this makes a difference. Export KMP underscore affinity. D place does not work with uh, Intel libraries unless you turn off this disabled. Now let me try it again here. And nope, it's still at a zero. Hmm. Well, let's see what we got here. What about the CPU set? Is that affecting it? Now let's double check. That's fine. Uh, I thought I was in the global, but good point. Uh, dev CPU set. It still should have been. It would have. D plays would have complained. I didn't want that. Proc dollar dollar. So I am in the global task set dash p. I think that program's probably finished by now. Dollar dollar. I have a full affinity situation here. Let me see if I can run this again. Uh, looks like it might have finished already. Oh, wrong number here. Still only putting me into one CPU. Let me bring up top. It is a static binary, and that may be rela related to my problem. Let me do an H. D place doesn't really work on static. And I can see they're all contained. I've got one that got put on zero and one that got put on one. So they're thrashing against each other. They're competing with each other. Okay, let me try something else. Uh, it hasn't got a more restrictive D place or whatever inside it, has it? Uh, there isn't. Again, I've got a static binary here, and D place doesn't work with a static binary. Okay, so I'm going to try to actually load live DSOs from the Intel library. That's not where it is. modules is going to work for me. Oh, I don't even see one in there. Hang on a second. Slash SW module files. My backup restore really did not work on this system. I'm going to have to figure out whether somebody cares. Okay, module load Intel 12, echo dollar path. Yeah, it is there. Maybe it was there before and I didn't notice. It was at the end. I was looking for it to be at the beginning. No, it definitely wasn't there before. But now let's see if I4 works. Oops. Not found. So my path is not right. CDSW, Intel, 
Intel 12 CD to Composer Splat SP1. I don't think that's the right location. CD into bin. I4 is there. Rehash, I fork. That's not a link to somewhere else. Oh no, it's a typo. Oh, good oh, point. Is it a link, maybe. Good point. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I was expecting that too. Let me uh, edit my SW file. Oops. What was the path actually now? Let's see. Intel has made it a lot harder for this stuff. Gotten uh, more complicated in there. Uh, Path control scripts. And I'm doing this so that I can get actual runtime libraries. That's something I regret and miss. SGI used to ship the Intel runtime library with Performance Suite to make it easy without having to deal with compilers and stuff. But they don't anymore. Fort is there. Oh well. Uh, I don't know if I want to go any further on this one right now. Did you well, did you see I fault in that um, part in that uh, Intel path name there? Is there actually an I fault there? I did. Again, this directory was a, a Yast backup restore. On Floyd 2, I, I did install the compilers. No, it's not there. I bet it's down in that. Try this. Oh. One last try here. When you install the compiler, it gives you the syntax to invoke this particular script. Is it down in that Intel 64? But uh, the way they're working it now is to uh, actually pass the platform in the, uh, it's not liking something here. Let me just try changing into that thing. install and look at some of these other things, they've gotten fancier with the Intel 12 compiler and there are arguments. When you actually, when you install it, it will tell you how to source the thing and it's showing you when, when the installation is done, how to invoke that thing that you have to pass in the platform type. Okay, now let's see if that fixes me. Still not found. So it, it's just corrupt on this system. Let me try it on uh, Floyd 2. So uh, CD to slash opt, 
cheated Intel because this was a clean install for me versus the other one being a restore backup. Let's try compiler. No, bin. I should probably have sourced it too. That might have been my problem before. Oops. What did I do wrong? Compiler. Oh, dot. Okay, at least I have an eye for it here now. Home guest, uh, real WL. Let's check my CPU set. They should all be turned off and I should be global, which I am. Okay, so now I'm going to do an I for it dash parallel to make it automatically parallel dash o3 dash little o I'm just going to call it code 2 MP code 2 MP or code 2 dot f Now D place is relative within the CPU set. <clears throat> Let me go to Floyd 2 on this one. But uh, two things there. Uh, D plate. D place and Intel OpenMP do not work together by default, and we need to turn off KMP underscore affinity. If you use D place without that, all threads are going to end up on the same CPU. And again, it won't work with a static. So that's why I had to go try to find a compiler. So now let me try a code 2 MP. I'm just going to fire this off. Let's bring up a top. There's my code to MP running. Notice it's greater than 100% here telling me, in fact, I've got a 32 CPU system, so I see this. And by the way, for both of you, the older tops would truncate at 999, and they put in a fix to top for me so that it would handle a 4096 CPU system. Let me do a dash capital H. There's the individual threads, and they're scattered. Look, we've got two threads. Uh, let's, I was looking for two that are on the same CPU. 23, I'm not seeing anything there right now. Okay, let me do this now. I'm gonna go 512 threads wide. Oops. Actually, I was running it in the other window. Let's run it in the other window again. Bring in top. So again, it looks like it's using all 32 CPUs. Trace dash F on two eight seven two four. See now this one is working and is following the children, so I can see it attached and detached to all the threads. And what are they doing? Sked yields. Sar dash W one space five. Oh, low context switching. I'm okay with this right now. Oh, the program finished. Let me try it again now.
low contact switching. I've been seeing a little bit better behavior with this system, but let's see if I can drive it crazy here. Can't break out. Let me put in the background. So I've deliberately created a overcommit to the CPUs, deliberately sticking the barriers. I may have pushed it too far here. Eleven thousand threads. Let's see if a Sardash W will work right now. I'm in a little bit of trouble. There we are. Look at the context switching now. Let me see if perf top works. There's our top. There's a barrier synchronization, but we only see, we're not seeing the schedules. This is actually behaving pretty good for me. Look at how big the CPU utilization is there, though. Something else is going on here. I just got too many threads. I got too aggressive with it. Uh, SAR one space five. And look at my system time is at 95%. If I do a perf top, let's see if it ever comes back. Oh. I eventually, I could not, there wasn't enough memory. All that was in the forks and stuff. Let's see if I can kill this thing now. <clears throat> That's a fairly new warning, by the way. Now, what I wanted to show you was if you take a look at uh, give it back to me. I figure I'm going a little bit longer here, and then we'll get done. Uh, I want to check something here. That was P2, right? P2? I can't tell from that. What happened here? I finally got out of top. Still don't have that one going yet. And we, I can't get logged in yet. Escape shift KDB. Let's just see what uh, summary does. Nothing going to swap, no dirty, no write back. Pretty big slab though. Why do we have a big slab? 10 gig. Still a lot of memory available, but we still hit a uh, 10 gig limit. That's the process table more than likely. I don't want to do a PS that got us into trouble the other day for something this big.
while this is cleaning up, I think I'm going to go back to the slides. I wanted to talk about D place and affinity, but let's go back to the workbook. Wait for that to work itself out. So what I was trying to deal with was cache affinity. Again, NUMA effects are not visible if data is on chip or at least on socket. Solve your cache stride problems. Solve your false cache sharing. And false cache sharing is also referred to as a hot cache line where multiple CPUs are writing the same cache line and CC NUMA kicks in. False cache sharing is what causes CC NUMA to use the directory memory to broadcast or multicast all CPUs that have a bit set saying they're sharing that cache line. What you try to do is decouple the cache line so that you don't have multiple CPUs writing to the same cache line. Also, thread hopping. This is another bad thing about the Linux kernel. You're going to see things bouncing all over the place. And if I, in my case, I've got a 10 second program that can go to 100 seconds, that's 10 times long. So now if I take a one hour program and it suddenly runs 10 hours because it keeps bouncing around the system. This was cache thrash due to the CPU scheduler. Don't overcommit your CPUs to prevent thread hops. You generally want your run queue size less than the number of CPUs. So you want to lock things down. Task set, CPU set, and I was trying to do D place. By the way, again, with D place, we need to disable export KMP underscore affinity. A lot of people get burned by this equals disable, but OM place, and a lot of people are trying to de uh, deprecate D place, and OM place instead actually does disable it. And OM place calls D place. So OM place is kind of a better interface to do everything, and one of the things it does is that. Otherwise, else, Intel, OpenMP will be on one CPU. I should say with D place. That's where I left off was trying to demonstrate that, but then I got too carried away. There is another interface called NUMA CTL, and there is a lib NUMA. I don't know if you knew IRIX, but in IRIX, the D place handled memory and CPU. But here you have two separate interfaces for the two. D-Place only deals with CPU. And I asked that D-Place handle memory, but they rejected it. I also want to keep things away from me using a boot CPU set and then batch PBS CPU sets. There is a flag to turn off that load balancing. And then there are environment variables that control things. Just let me move on here. So the load balance occurs when you have a greater than 25% difference between two run queues. We load balance if a fork or an exec occurs. We have a load balance periodically occurring. The isolate CPUs turns off the load balancer. That's for the real-time market when people are pinning down a video reader or something like that. We pull from the highest load, highest load CPU, migrating half the difference. So let's just take an example. I got one uh, CPU that's at 17 threads and the other one that's at, let's just say, 22 threads. So this is a CPU A, CPU B. So what we're going to do is 22 minus the 17, what's that, 5? So we're going to move 5 from here, which gets me down to 17, it looks. What's going on here? Oh, half the difference. I'm sorry. So half the difference, five. So we're going to pull three from this one, leaving me 19 here. And then uh, the other two will get moved, or the three got moved to this one, leaving me 20 here. I don't know if I did the math exactly right, but that's the general concept. They do half the difference. I happen to pick a delta that was an odd number, though. Okay, we will pull from the expired queue, then the active queue. We will avoid what are called cache hot processes, and we don't touch anything that has that affinity. And that's where I was in demo, was trying to get that affinity to work right. But I think it was because I was using a static application, not a, a DSO. 
Dplace does not work with static. Okay, so here's the story here. Uh, this is kind of strange for me, but we, we've got five different ways of counting priority. The first one is what the kernel has. So the kernel has a zero being the best and a 140 being the worst, 140 being max PRIO, and there's a max real time, so everything between zero and 100 is real time. And when you're in crash, you can find the real time priority. There is a lab where you're going to uh, fill in a table with all these different numbers and use crash to look at it. Real time, our interactive is the 100 to 140. We come in at 120 by default. That's called the static PRIO. Now, when it's printed to PROC PID STAT, they subtract 100 from it. So when we are in top, anything that's negative or has an RT is a real time. So if we, and by the way, top does not match PS. If I did a PS-L, I would see 80. If I did a PS-C, I would see 19. And top would give me 20. I always complained about that. So there is priority, there's pri, and there's opri. And part of the table you fill out in lab is to compute these and see if they match. So when I print the static priority out, subtract 100 from it, 100 becomes 0, 120 becomes 20, 139 becomes 39. So again, by default, you come in at 20. Now, there used to be a degrading concept here where you would go up and down depending on how you're sleeping, but that was less 10. And if I do a, the only thing that's going to affect my priorities is if I do a nice. If I do a negative nice, I'm not being nice, and my priority is going to go up. And th this priority would also go up with it. If I do a nice 19, that would degrade my priority, and I would see nice go to 19, but I'd also see my priority in top go to like 39. However, for whatever reason, I don't understand why, and the documentation, the code in PROC PS doesn't make any sense about uh, Sun OS and stuff like that. I've never seen priority ranges in the 0 to 39 or the 60 to 99. So PS-C has 39 and then subtracts priority from it. And PS-L adds 60 to it. So in this case, the lower number has a higher priority, but in this case, the higher number has a better priority. So there's a lab step to fill out a table and run things and, and see what these numbers are. Trying to wrap up here. Real-time schedule, we can do round robin or first out. Round robin are still scheduled by the, the clock interrupts, the jiffies. You do have the ability in a real time to set your scheduler or get your settings, get the interval that you're uh, getting the jiffies on, set the scheduler itself, and you can also set priorities. With first in, first out, you don't lose the CPU by a, a clock tick. You don't lose it because of a jiffy. The only way that process is going to get kicked out is if it has sched yield voluntarily. By the way, there is a command, cheroot, that can set or retrieve what your real-time properties are. Okay, these are again a little bit old. Migration thread is the thing that moves things off in an uh, ineligible CPU to do load balancing. Events is gone. Events is now KWorker. And that is basically an interrupt handler. KSoft IRQ is going to be the CPU number after it. That's the thing handling network interrupts like network and SCSI. KSwap D, one per node, one per socket, swap in, or I'm sorry, swap out when out of memory. That's going to do the trim, the slab, and the trim of the page cache. There are a couple others here. I'm not even sure if KBlock D is there anymore. I did see K Helper, XFS journaling, I did see data. I'm not sure about data. We were seeing that as buff D, I think. XFS buff D. I think that daemon's still there though. And sync D for the metadata. And for asynchronous IO and flush and Q logic drivers. Just kind of give you an idea what some of them do. So here I was just playing with priorities. So if there's a program out there for CPU Pry, 
The first one is the uh, iterations. The second one is the number, the priority number they want. And then I did a PS-O on the command. And all three priorities. Priority is what top is going to show. Pri and O pri are what PS is going to show. So here I went to a 99. Now I don't know why, but it actually comes one off. So it becomes 100 or 139 or 40. Then I did it to a 1. So that came out as a minus 2. And again, I'm off by 1 and I never figured out why. Or the uh, pri being 41 or the O pri being 58. PS-L is this third one. I also put it in the background and there was no change. Uh, on IRAX programs that went in the background did have their priority changed. Anyway, this is comparing it with, without putting it in the background and they have the same priorities. No, actually this one went down to 25, didn't it? Uh, not sure why. Let's see, that's within top. I don't know what happened there. And I'm the one that, I'm the one that generated this. Well, let's move on. So if you are in crash, you can run the task command and get grep for pry. Then you can see the uh, what's called the uh, effective priority. <coughs> it used to change, but doesn't anymore. <coughs> then the static, and then the real time. So nice changes the priority of the uh, process. Giving a lower CPU priority. <coughs> Excuse me. There is a nice in the, in, built into the shell versus a nice command. They have different syntax. You have the ability of setting nices with the limits, and also in XI and D, you can specify a nice for FTPs. So I just ran through a whole bunch of nice examples. <coughs> We've looked at these monitoring tools. Find inefficient applications. If you're CPU bound, fix the applications first. Solve your barrier problems. Solve your sharing problems. All these things are CPU time. So we've looked at this. Run queue size, running and runnable. Load level includes the IO SCAD and the down lock. <coughs> and I was just listing some of the common locks that I was seeing. So you could have an NFS server that has a high load level and no CPU utilization because all of the metadata activity that the NFS server is doing. And we've looked at SAR-Q already. Now I'm just letting you know about this. There is a thing here for adjusting kernel schedulers. I don't know if either of you are interested. I have a PDF file where I documented as much as I could about the scheduler in each of these parameters. I did have an RFE to get it documented, but nobody uh, had the bandwidth to do that sort of thing. This is the one that I was looking for. I, in the past, would like it to see it at a one. And I was gonna try to actually drive up. I looked at my system time in a minute ago, and all that system time was sked yields. And it should have used the CPU time and passed it to one of the other programs that I was running. And when I do a compat sked yield, a lot of that system time goes away, and it is effective in actually context switching to the other processes that I was running. But I'm pretty much out of time on doing that sort of thing. But again, I do have a document that documents the bits here. And then I've got some documentation here. Uh, this is kind of painful with a large CPU system. By the way, when you use uh, System Info Gather, it's going to get rid of all the per CPU and per network interface stuff at, the, at a non-verbose level. You have to be at a five Vs to be able to get everything. More documentation. And there is the ability, I've tried to document these files, but there is the ability of this uh, IBM person, uh, Rick Lund, I think his name is, has scripts to basically read these files and generate a trace. So here he's running a command here looking at latency. And then this is from his script. This is not anything you'll find in uh, perform in uh, the release itself, integrated in any release. 
but then is basically copying the proc stat debug file periodically into a file and then running a processor on it. So here, uh, no sched yields, but I was popped into the scheduler 2,000 times. Uh, switched between active and inactive, 85% of the time I went to the expired. For, uh, barely ever I used the existing, and 12% of the time there was no process and I went idle. And then it's just showing some of the other. I did a, went into try wake up 744 times, and all those were able to be woken up on the same CPU as the waker. Also getting the average latency runtime, how long, what the time slices are like. Number of times I pulled the task and did load. Actually, we have load balancing kicking in, but it looks like none of them were pulled. And the number of times we called the load balancer while we were idle was basically all the time. And then there were a couple of times that we called while we were busy. So I, I was showing you earlier in the week this proc sked debug showing each CPU. So here we've got things like number of running, what the load level is, the number of context switches on a per CPU basis, number of non number of uninterruptible. Here's the number of jiffies it got, things of that sort. Now we've got two classes here. So this is for the completely fair. That's the interactive. And then we got another one for real time. And this is the, the weighting factor that the completely fair scheduler is using. Number running, load level, number of yields. So we've got specific yield information context switch specifics. I don't remember what TTWU was, but I documented in, in my uh, uh, scheduler document that I have. But this is what was relevant, so I could look at a CPU, because there's a CPU number in front of each of these. Then I can see what's running there, number of context switches, priorities, and things of that sort. And also, this looks like the crash task command where I'm looking at different things on a per process basis. Number of migrations, wake ups, things of that sort. I'm just letting you know it's here. And in proc PID SCED, I have a whole bunch of information as well on a particular process. Number of switches, number of voluntary, number of involuntary, uh, wake ups, migration activity. I don't have every one of these documented, but and this stuff up here, this is the CFS stuff, the weighting factor, the usage factor. In IREX for the uh, fair share scheduler, we used to call that thing uh, a bank account, and an ent I like the word entitlement. C groups were generally turning off. We use CPU sets instead. So in your uh, boot parameters, there's usually C groups for memory that's turning it off. But this is part of our entitlement concept. We have group or user, but only one can be enabled at a time. So in a C group situation, you set up a share tree. Maybe Army is 50, Navy is 50, but under Navy, aircraft is 33% and ships is 66%. So you set up a fair share tree. Again, I don't advise doing this particularly in a large CPU system. You don't get your real share because you're going to have thrashing a lot. Uh, this is just, again, straight out of documentation to set up C groups. They created a dev for it, mounted it. They made a subdirectory, and then they set up their shares in it. And then they've demonstrated. Or here, they mounted it as a CPU set. C groups do overlap with CPU sets. Created the dev or CD'd in the dev CPU set they just mounted, created a directory, and then set up the CPU set that was there for it. And there was a thing to specify what C group they were in. But we're using a different interface. Are you still there? Still there. Uh, it looks like my WebEx just crashed. I don't have WebEx running anymore. I still see it. I've still got the um, slide up. Yeah, but I can't get anything right now. 
believe that's a clue that we're done for the day. <laughs> All my web browsers crashed. I must have hit an out of memory on my Windows system. That would do it. Was there anything else in the workbook? I don't think there was. It was just more sked debug stuff. I think I'm done. Flip through the last couple of pages and see if there's anything of interest to you there. I think at this point I'm just going to call it a class. Call it the end of the week. Yep. How about you, Carlos? Any questions or anything in the workbook? Again, at this point, uh, you can send me email, and I do have some of the stuff recorded from part. I do have prior classes available on my website as well. I'm just going to check here. All I had was a summary page. So with that, there's no sense in us pushing any further. It's 6 o'clock for Mike, and it's a weekend for him. And uh, I appreciate all your patience during the week. I've pushed you pretty hard here, hoping it was constructive for you. You can never predict how these kernels are behaving, so that's what I was trying to do is stress the new kernel and see what it looks like. So if there aren't any questions, we're done. Okay. That yeah, work, okay. Uh, Mike, if you did want to use the uh, Floyd two or three tomorrow morning your time or the weekend, feel free. It won't okay. be uh, reused until next week. All right. So send me email o over the weekend if there's any issues. I do watch email. Uh, okay. If you do want to use it, let me know because I might be on one of them as well. So. I'm just saying if you did want to spend a little bit more time over the weekend to try one of these labs or play some of the games that I have, let me know, but the machines are not scheduled or reserved for anybody for the weekend. Okay? okay. Yeah. So I appreciate your patience, and I'm done for the class. Thank you, everybody. Thank See you, ya. Dave. Okay, goodbye. Bye. The leader has disconnected. The conference will be terminated in two minutes. The leader has disconnected. The conference will now end.